Good evening. Goodbye Forever, Volume 2 by Natal Rumshi, Chapter 5, Part 2. I discovered that the subject of religion makes some people quite belligerent. It makes others pretentious, self-righteous, querulous, sanctimonious, hypercritical, censorious, supercilious, condescending, contemptuous and self-obsessed. Not that I entirely lack those propensities, but I prefer to live and let live. I tend to feel that my opinions are merely opinions. Opinions are subjective and therefore I see no reason to make bludgeons out of them. Why would I wish to demand conformity of others? Det once took me to task for saying I preferred Bach to Mozart. She explained to me, world opinion would not be on your side. I responded, I don't doubt you. I'm quite prepared to accept that world opinion's not on my side. Then why do you persist in holding a contrary view? I don't quite see it as a contrary view. It's merely my preference. I enjoy Mozart a great deal, but were I to be cast away on Roy Plumley's island, I'd take Bach rather than Mozart. Det shook her head, as she did when I exasperated her. So I continued, I'm not trying to influence the world with my subjective opinion. The world's free to believe whatever it wishes, I suppose. I'm not even saying that world opinion is wrong. I'm just voicing a subjective personal opinion. Yes, but opinions have to be backed by fact. Yes, I sighed, they do, if you wish to challenge someone else's opinion but I have no desire to challenge anyone else's opinion or have them demand that their subjective opinion is objective and therefore invalidates my non-objective opinion. But some things are objective. Yes, Det, I'm not saying that there are no objective facts. I accept that terminal velocity is 120 miles an hour, be it a grand piano, a banjo or a broad beam that falls from the sky. I accept that gravity is a fact and that objects on this planet fall at 22 feet per second, per second, even though I have no idea what that mathematical formulation means. I don't have any subjective opinion as to whether it would be more aesthetically pleasing to fall at the rate of 21 feet or 23 feet per second, because that would be silly. Art and ideas of beauty, however, are almost entirely subjective. Well, you won't find any intelligent person who would agree to such a proposition. You may well be right, Det, but I'm not looking for anyone to agree with me. You see, I don't need approval. I never have done. So you don't care what I think? Yes, just not terribly much on this subject. Det looked at me rather severely at that point. I do care what you think of me, Det, and that isn't always unproblematic. I care what you think, or I would not be able to be with you. I can see that there is value in criticality. I can see that everything that's called art can't have the same value. Some works of art are staggeringly wonderful and others I might not even describe as art. So what's the problem then? The problem is that I wouldn't demand that other people agreed with my definition 
of what constituted art. Maybe not, but there are well accepted criteria. Yes, debt, I sighed. There are, and sometimes I find myself in agreement with them. And sometimes I don't. I'm obviously open to guidance, but I won't be ruled because in the end, it's all subjective. And so we're back to the same thing again, no matter what I say. It would seem so, Det, but you also have to bear in mind that we're back to the same place, no matter what I say. We would both seem guilty of the same offence. A neat evasion. I think, Det, that I'll not reply to that. So, you'll just ignore me? No, I just do not choose to respond to caustic accusations. You know, the world would be a far friendlier place if people allowed each other to have subjective opinions without challenging, challenging them on the basis of consensus reality. Blue is not a better colour than green or vice versa. Blue and green should always be seen if someone likes that combination and not if they don't. It's fairly simple. Human beings are, or should be, free to enjoy whatever subjective criteria they please in their own lives. But there are objective criteria that govern whether value or beauty can be ascribed or not. Yes, there are, debt, and whilst I have no problem with you holding that view, it does not suit me to hold it. But then everything is arbitrary. From my point of view, that is often the case. But I'm not demanding that you accept my subjective criteria. I've said that I see the value of the criteria you've mentioned and I'm certainly always open to bearing it in mind. I'm just not open to being ruled by it. Just as you are not open to being ruled by a religious framework. And so it went on. I was always mild and well-mannered about it, but always obdurate in my conviction. Consensus real realists could eat cake as far as I was concerned. Lovely rich fruit cake encased in delicious homemade marzipan. Reaching this impasse with debt, however, always left me feeling ill at ease with myself. We'd reached this impasse before and I could never find a way out of the situation. I was content for Debt to hold whatever view she wanted, but she always had to launch assaults on my freedom of perception. The reason these impasses left me feeling ill at ease was that they spotlighted the fact that mutual respect was lacking. I didn't want to lay the blame at Debt's door for starting it, even though I knew quite well that it was Debt who'd first found me wanting in terms of impeccability vis-à-vis -vis my artistic standpoint. I'd tried to take on as much of her view of art as I could, but she refused to find any value in the view of reality that I was presenting. I knew that this was a major problem in terms of relationship as it was presented from the point of view of Vajrayana. Couples were supposed to suffuse their relationship with openness and kindness. They were supposed to trust and respect each other with equal enthusiasm. They were supposed to appreciate each other with gleeful delight. I felt that mutual appreciation had been there at the beginning of my relationship with debt, but that as time passed, she'd wanted to coach me increasingly 
vis-à-vis -vis what was culturally superior. Bob Dylan and Shakespeare could not be spoken of as being on equal terms, even though I'd never expressed that idea. I would never attribute exact equivalences. I would only speak of equal enjoyment. I enjoyed Bob Dylan. I enjoyed Shakespeare. Ideas of higher or lower were alien. The style of enjoyment was different perhaps, but that was as far as I was ever prepared to take it. Whenever I reflected on this impasse, a sense of gloom stole over me. I knew that the dynamics of our relationship were awry from the point of view of Vajrayana. We should respect each other, but we'd failed to do so. There were many things we liked about each other, but Det mainly enjoyed me as a sexual amanuensis. That seemed peculiar to me, as that was mainly women's complaint about men. A fundamental sense of respect was lacking. I tried in vain to share the blame for the lack of respect between us, but I knew that I had not been the first to launch offensives, nor had I been the one to continue onslaughts. I actually never criticised debt on a subjective basis. I listened to Fred Astaire songs with her and even had some of what she liked. That openness, however, was almost never reciprocated. I merely continued to be more or less as I was when I met Det. At first she'd found me intriguing, but that intrigue seemed to be moving incrementally in the direction of irritation. My conviction concerning subjective opinions being equal in their subjectivity was not open to be assailed. More to the point, I had no interest in defending my view. I avoided the subject whenever I could and changed the subject as quickly as possible if it ever looked as if it was going to emerge. One day, Det rebuked me for being unwilling to see reason. Would you just like me to agree with you? I inquired with a sense of perplexity. But you wouldn't mean it. Quite, I sighed. That would be the problem, wouldn't it? You know, Det, what you actually want of me is religious conversion. There was a splutter of objection from Det at that point, but I raised my hand and continued, No, Det. I snapped my fingers and pointed directly at her. For once, I would like you to hear me out, because I have something to say that you might find helpful in terms of understanding where I'm coming from. You want me to embrace the artistic cultural equivalent of the one true God, because it's your religion. There's no problem with that in one way, but I've never tried to convert you to Buddhism. I mean, how would you feel if I tried to do that? How would you feel if I used the battering ram of Buddhist logic on you and brought Buddhist logic to bear whenever we disagreed on the subject of the arts? For once, Det thought for a moment before replying, that would be a valid point, all but for the fact that we are both at art school and not at a Buddhist seminary. You chose to apply to art school and that is what we have in common. We don't have Buddhism in common and I've never trespassed on your field of expertise. I've never talked to you about Buddhism and rearranged all the rules of the game in ways that are not concordant with it. 
that was something of a shock. The comment Det had made was entirely valid. I had no choice but to acknowledge it. You're entirely right, Det. That's an irrefutable position. I'm going to have to dwell on what that means in terms of, well, anyhow, I must say I admire your logical acuity. I'll always bow to superior logic. Det sat and stared at me as if I'd just agreed that the earth was not flat. So you're saying that what I just said was right and you have no argument with it? Correct. I cannot contest what you've said. So? So now I need to dwell on what the implications are. I sat in silence for a while and Det eventually asked, So where are you in your ruminations? Well, Det, it seems that I may well have made an error, and one for which I owe you an apology. It seems that I should not have wasted your time. What do you mean? I simply mean that I've been a waste of your time, and I'm sorry for that. I still don't know what you mean. I mean that I'm not a suitable partner for you and you'd probably best be rid of me. Now you're just being dramatic to shock me. Why would you say a thing like that? Well, Det, you're not interested in Buddhism, and as Buddhism informs the way I see the world, it conflicts with your perspective on art. As far as Buddhism is concerned, the entire realm of phenomenal reality is subjective or illusory, and so it's not likely that I can ever change my view on that. Because of that, I'm going to be a ceaseless cause of irritation to you. Ah! Several moments of silence followed. Det was obviously shocked. She recognised the possible termination of our relationship and, for reasons I never understood, decided to pull back. She knew me well enough to know that I could suddenly become absolutely serious and capable of making life-changing decisions in which I'd not to vacillate. Well, if it's a matter of religion, Det harumphed, I suppose I will have to let you have your own ideas on the subject of art. Far be it from me to get between a man and his religion. And that's really all right with you? Well, of course it is. I just never realised that this subjectivity thing was of such enormous doctrinal importance. And that was it. I'd been on the edge of bidding debt adieu with the real sense in which my departure would be welcomed. But it hadn't been welcomed at all. I think that Det had no idea at all of how frustrated I'd become, and it seemed that it might be possible that we needn't have any more of these hideously turgid arguments about art. I took my leave of Det, and we parted as amicably as if we'd never been conceptually embattled. These contretemps never seemed to cause debt long-term disquiet. She could act, and really seem, as if they'd never occurred. It was certainly a more pleasant way to be than hanging on to the ambience of strife, but it also seemed unreal. I knew that llamas could manifest fleeting displays of something that looked like anger, but debt's capacity for the sudden onset of equanimity was more likely a question of repression rather than non-dual nonchalance. Of course, I'd reciprocate her change of mood as a matter of course and then go sit with how that felt. What would Kyabje Dujamrimshe make of my situation? 
I tried to imagine explaining it to him and the result was that I felt like a complete idiot. The scenario felt like explaining theft to a policeman. You see, officer, it just happened. I put these things in my bag because they looked as if they were the right size. Appalling analogy, because Dudjum Rimshe was as unlike a policeman as I could imagine. But my mindset felt criminal in terms of how I was supposed to be living my life. I was supposed to be learning how to live in British culture rather than merely acquiescing to it. I was merely learning what a mess I was making of life. There was little or no choice involved in my relationship with debt. She'd simply made overtures and I'd accepted them. I'd done that before with Helen McGilvery and had obviously learned nothing from the mistake. Helen McGilvery had corrected the mistake by leaving me, but I had the feeling that debt was not going to take the same initiative. I was going to have to be the one to say goodbye forever. On the night before I left for Sammy Ling, I started packing. I got out the splendid leather panniers and Merrill chuckled. You're taking several changes of wardrobe, I see. Well, yes, but only because I need to take my robes. Robes? Merrill asked, and then I explained. The ladies all wanted to see them. Then they wanted to see me dressed in them, so I obliged. They were surprised, but not distanced. They were intrigued and asked endless questions. I enjoyed answering them and felt entirely at ease being who I was. I was an art student, but I was also a Nakba. I'd probably always led some sort of double life. After all, I planned on a career as an art school lecturer. I'd planned to return to the Himalayas for longer sojourns when I retired. I could make visits to India and Nepal in the winter recess from art school every year. It was also possible to take year-long sabbaticals. I'd just see how it all fell out. It was impossible to plan the rest of my life that minutely, but the general theme of it seemed workable. You don't seem, commented Rebecca, like the usual sort of Buddhist. Not that I have any idea what a Buddhist should be like, but I'd imagined someone less fun to be around. Thank you. Glad to hear it. I think you're right, though, in as much as I'm possibly not the usual sort of Buddhist. I was never the usual sort of hippie, and I'm probably not really the usual sort of anything. That's always been something of a problem. Not for me, but for other people. It's never been a problem for us three. It's what makes you interesting to talk to, Rebecca laughed. I think us three girls would have bored each other to death if you hadn't moved in. And so it was resolved. I could just be what I was and life could flow on as it would. Sometimes one of the three ladies would come up to my room when I was wrapped in my shawl and staring into space and simply leave me to it. It became a normal part of what Vic was in the house. Sometimes Buddhism would become part of the conversation, but it would arise naturally and dissolve naturally. I wasn't entirely sure whether I would wear my robes at the Kagyu Samilings Buddhist Centre or not. I supposed that would depend on what things fell out on my arrival. I supposed I would inquire what the etiquette was and act appropriately. I'd never been to a Buddhist centre in the West before, and whilst it seemed entirely natural to wear robes in the Himalayas, I had no idea what it would feel like in Britain. I put the issue to the ladies. I'm curious, said Merrill. You're entirely blasé about unconventional dress and don't seem self-conscious in your white suit, 
but when it comes to your robes, it all changes. That's not a criticism, Vic, it's just an observation. I mean, I find it actually nice that you have this side of you. Hmm, I mused, rubbing leather preservative into one of my leather motorcycle panniers. I think I just have the terrors of being a holy roller or some sort of creep. I've met a fair few alternative religious types and I'd hate to be seen to be anything like what I've seen. You see, and I think you understand that I'm not doing this to be superior or whatever. That's what makes me a little tentative. Well, just to let you know, smiled Merrill, you don't need to be tentative with us. I shall remove every shred of unsightly canvas immediately, I chuckled. Then, in response to Merrill's evident bewilderment, I continued, Did you hear of the fellow who went to his doctor because he thought he was schizophrenic? His doctor asked him why he had come to that conclusion, and the man replied, Well, doctor, sometimes I think I'm a wigwam, and sometimes I think I'm a teepee. Ah, said the doctor, I see your problem. You're not schizophrenic, you're just too tense. So be gone, all yurts, marquees and tents of every kind. That's better, laughed Rebecca. That's the Vic we know and love. Pass over the other pannier and I'll give it a rub. I think you should wear your robes in Scotland. After all, it's a Buddhist centre and if you can't wear them there, where else in Britain could you wear them? I nodded in agreement. They were given to you to be worn, so wear them, added Penelope. I'd say the same, Merrill smiled. Anything we can do? There are the leather straps, if you like, and then there'll be a little work with Brasso on the buckles. And so we chatted through the evening, sipping wine and working at a leisurely pace on the panniers. It was hard to imagine a better life than this. I felt twinges of regret that being with Debt was nowhere near as delightful as being with her three friends. I also felt twinges of regret that my time in Hotwells would have to end. Of course, life had to end as well, so who was I to whine?